give you forewarning, I'm not a food scientist. I'm not a nutritionist. I'm uh, more of the biochemistry, molecular biology, physiology type person. Um, but what I was asked to do is give a little bit of, no, of an overview of digestion and absorption, and then uh, also talk about uh, uh, some impacts of dietary fatty acids on postprandial inflammation. And I'm going to be talking about the immediate postprandial uh, period. Uh, I've already learned uh, a lot this morning. It's been very interesting. and. Uh, I, I'm hoping that uh, some of the experts here will be able to fill in some of the, the details. So uh, just disclosure, most of my funding, funding has been from um, uh, public institutions. Um, the only other affiliation I have is with a small uh, biotech startup, which uh, began earlier this year, uh, looking at uh, new targets of HDL and small molecules to raise HDL, and Cincy Tech is a uh, source of some pilot funds for that. Uh, so I'll begin with an overview of digestion and absorption, just in general terms. Uh, then look at uh, review some of the literature on specific effects of the interesterified fats and structured triglycerides. Um, mention a few areas of potential investigation that I think I see, and maybe some of the experts here will be able to um, uh, provide some input on that and, and let me know where I've uh, uh, missed some of the relevant literature. And then, I'm, as I said, I'm going to go on to postprandial inflammation. Uh, I'm going to talk about two areas, um, intestinal mast cell activation during lipid absorption. Uh, my close colleague, uh, Patrick So, has, done, has published recently in this area, has some interesting data. And then I'm going to talk, about, talk a little bit about circulating leukocytes and, and, uh, and how they're activated after lipid absorption. And again, looking only at the postprandial um, period and also some um, talk about areas that I think need further investigation. And I think Casey Hayes will probably have some uh, input on, on what uh, is necessary there. So overview of lipid digestion, it begins in the stomach, as all of you know, with gastric lipase, which generates free fatty acids and diglycerides and accounts for about 15% of triglyceride digestion. Uh, then in the, in the small intestine, food is emulsified by bile salts and phospholipids, which are released when CCK stimulates gallbladder contraction after a meal. And it's also, uh, uh, this emulsification is helped by digestion products from um, gastric lipase activity. And then in the small, in, uh, lumen of the small intestine, you've got the activities of pancreatic lipase, PTL, which needs its cofactor colipase, of course. And this is where the bulk of, of lipolysis occurs, in the duodenum and the upper jejunum, releasing free fatty acids and two monoglycerides, uh, as, as people have already alluded to before. And these digested lipids are incorporated into uh, a mix, into mixed micelles with bile salts and actually also with the partially uh, hydrolyzed phospholipids, such that there's a, a, a kind of an a continuum of an oil phase, emulsion, micellar phase, and aqueous phase uh, that's a continuum in the intestinal lumen, uh, and the aqueous phase includes, um, to some degree, the um, uh, unstirred water layer at the brush border. There we go. Some ancillary lipases that don't get a lot of press, but uh, can be important in special situations. The pancreatic lipase-related protein 2, PLRP2, it's also secreted by the pancreas. Uh, it shows similar activity of PTL. It's present at much lower levels in adults. Uh, but it's very important for fat absorption in neonates and young infants. Biosalt-stimulated lipase, uh, BSSL, cholesterol esterase, carboxyl ester lipase, goes by a lot of names. Um, is also secreted by the pancreas and hydrolyzes triglycerides. It actually can hydrolyze them completely to free fatty acids and glycerol. Uh, it's stimulated by trihydroxy bile salts. It's actually inhibited by dihydroxies. It's abundant in milk, in most milks, not all, and it's important for fat absorption in neonates. Um, but in adults, as with P uh, LRP2, PLRP2, it's secondary to PTL. And um, some of the comparative work on the relative importance of these has been done 
uh, using knockout mice that were generated uh, in Cincinnati and um, uh, the RP2 knockout was actually generated at Harvard. I think. Uh, another enzyme activity that's not involved in triglyceride um, digestion, but it is involved in the general emulsification process, and I mention it because of some of the metabolic effects that it has as well that are relevant to the overall health discussion today, and that's phospholipase A2, PLA2 uh, that's secreted by the pancreas. Again, another pancreatic enzyme. It generates uh, free fatty acids from the two position of phospholipids and generates lysopc uh, from both biliary and dietary phospholipids. Now, the intestine also makes a phospholipase B uh, beginning in the mid-jejunum and lower jejunum, which is able to digest phos phospholipids uh, uh, completely to, phos uh, to fatty acids and phosphorylcholine, which has been absorbed. So PLA2, although it's not required for overall phospholipid absorption, it has a large impact on metabolic disease. Uh, PLA2 knockout mice, for example, are resistant to diet-induced uh, diabetes and obesity. And this is uh, current data uh, from the group, and, and this is work done by David Huey, he's a, uh, a good friend and collaborator of mine in Cincinnati. Current data suggests that it's due to a, an immediate postprandial flux of lysopc, which gets into the uh, portal circulation and has effect on, um, on hepatic function. Uh, gluconeogenesis and uh, and other functions there. Uh, in terms of specificity, and, and other people have already touched on this, gastric glycase shows a preference for fatty acids in the SN3 position. Uh, some data suggests that it has uh, a preference for short and medium chains, uh, but this could be due to a preponderance of those fatty acids in the substrates that were used in the assays where this data came from. So there's also data suggesting that the um, gastric lipase doesn't have very much of a, of a chain length preference, but it is uh, an SN3 specific one. Uh, pancreatic lipase is specific for the 1,3s, generating two, the two diglycerides. Um, I've not seen any information anywhere, any data anywhere, suggesting that there's any stereospecificity uh, to it at all. And it does, but it does show some preference for chain length, you know, being more active on, um, on medium chains and shorter chains, and less active on long and very long chain fatty acids. Uh, but it still has activity there. Um, and, and the difference can range as much as sixfold. However, in the lumen of the intestine, there's so much pancreatic lipase and lipase activity that the substrate preference may not be uh, something that we see in vivo. And CEL, or biosolid stimulated lipase, um, is actually, uh, has a greater, on a, on a molar basis, is more active toward the very long chain fatty acids um, than PTL. Fatty acid uptake by the enterocytes uh, has been a bit controversial over the last several years. It doesn't appear to be the rate-limiting step for what I would consider the typical dietary fatty acids. Uh, these are able to flip-flop across the membrane, and they're esterified inside the enterocyte by any one of the family of the FATP proteins, which uh, um, may, uh, is esterified, thioesterified to CoA, and that traps them inside the cell and actually maintains a concentration gradient facilitating continued uptake of the fatty acids. Yes, yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Ask them to mute their phone. Someone has an open phone out there. Uh, someone has an open phone out there. Could you mute that, mute that please? Okay. All right. We're here. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, and two, mono two monoglyceride also appears to cross the membrane uh, by diffusion mechanism. Um, not a lot in the, I haven't seen a lot in the literature out there. So a direct role for transporters such as CD36 uh, has been implied and there was a lot of uh, papers pu published on this. But the um, direct transporters may only be significant when you have very low substrate levels or when the fatty acids are presented in something other than as a micelle.
Uh, actually, if you look even at some of the CD36 knockout data, uh, I was going back and reviewing that uh, a little while ago. And um, in those knockout mice, they would take inverted sacs or, or intestinal preparations of some kind, and they could show that without CD36, there was a decrease in fatty acid absorption. But actually, in those cases, they presented the fatty acid bound to BSA. And it's very cle clear that CD36 is important for uptake um, uh, of BSA-bound fatty acids in the circulation. But its role in the intestine is um, well, still debated, but probably not, uh, not a significant role. So most data are consistent with the flip-flop model. Um, so then these things have to get resynthesized and, and made into chylomicrons. The exact role of the FABPs, the fatty acid binding proteins inside the cell. So there's the intestinal one and the uh, liver one. The liver one is also very abundant in the intestine. Whether or not they're important for moving fatty acids around inside the cell specifically for triglyceride um, uh, synthesis is not entirely clear, at least from data in knockout mice. Uh, but it, the, the uh, resynthesis of triglycerides occurs in the ER. Um, primarily, it's believed through the mechanisms of MGAT2 and DGAT, DGAT1. So there's three MGAT enzymes. MGAT2 is the one which is most abundant in the intestine and is, um, in terms of its activities and substrate utilization, uh, appears to be the primary one, primary one involved for uh, taking two monoglycerides and adding fatty acid to it. Actually, the MGAT2 enzyme also has a considerable amount of uh, DGAT activity. Uh, DGAT1 is the uh, enzyme which is most abundant, most abundant of the two DGATs that's in the intestine. Um, Oh, the thing about MGAT2 is that it doesn't appear to have any specificity for the free fatty acids that it's going to add to the two monoglyceride. But in a, a figure which I'll show you on the next slide, it actually it does appear to be less active toward two sterile magne, uh, MAG monoglyceride um, than to some of the other uh, possibilities. DGAT doesn't appear to have any distinct specificity for fatty acid substrates, uh, but a preference for 18.1 as compared to 16.0, oh, 18.3, or 24 has been seen in some competition assays. Uh, again, these are in vitro assays, and whether or not these are physiologically important isn't, um, isn't clear to me yet. Uh, so here's a slide from, uh, uh, from the uh, this paper by Cow et al. And um, I'm sorry, we lost the resolution, but in terms of the monoglycerides, which you can appreciate, this is the 18-0 um, laid here. And so this is 18-0 given as a monoglyceride. This is the band of diglycerides here. And you can appreciate that um, it's just not a very good substrate for, mono, for MGAT to um, add a fatty acid to and, and move it up. And it's, it's shown uh, graphically down below. There's a real preference for the, um, uh, even for something as low as 8. This is 8, 12, 18, 8, 12, 16, uh, and then 18, uh, 18, 1, 2, and 3. And, um, you know, the, the, uh, if you look at this part of the graph right here, these is, there's essentially no difference in uh, preference for fatty acids. This is a range of fatty acids being used to make diglycerides, and there really isn't much of a difference. Chylomarker and assembly is, uh, occurs uh, facilitated by MTP, microsomal triglyceride transfer protein, which transfers lipid to ApoB48 as the protein is being synthesized. This is critical. Making a pre chylomicron particle, which uh, then moves to the ER and actually is merged with another lipid droplet, again facilitated, facilitated by MTP. Uh, and, and that particle has uh, a mole molecules of ApoA4 on it. 
um, Baedeker's and the smoothie are, this, this joining. And then it moves into the Golgi where additional, like a lot, some additional modifications are made in terms of lipids. And also APOA1 and the C's and other proteins are added. And then the colomicron um, is, uh, uh, is secreted into the lymphatics, into the lacteals, and uh, enters the circulation via the subclavian vein. And this just shows a, a, a picture I want to uh, Charlie Mansbach in, in Tennessee has done a lot of the critical work on all of this intracellular processing in terms of the assembly of these pre um, uh vesicles containing ApoB and another pre lipid droplet containing ApoA4, merging in the smooth ER, moving to the Golgi where there's additional modifications as it's, um, as it's processed. So now I'll switch um, and, and just review a little bit about a little bit of the literature that um, I was able to find about the absorption and transport of fatty acids given as structured triglycerides or interesterified lipids. Um, the, the lipids most characterized are those that are comprised of medium and long chain fatty acids, as this group very well knows. Um, and there's a host of investigate host of publications have shown that absorption and lymphatic transport of fatty acids from the intestinal or from interesterified lipids is not the same as absorption from an equivalent mix of the two parent oils. Um, now, other than the lipase preferences that I mentioned before for natural oils and fats, I've not been able to see. Uh, I've not been able to notice any difference in luminal lipolysis of the engineered fats, uh, except as these modifications, as was alluded to earlier, affects the solubility of these fats in mixed micelles, either as the um, uh, triglyceride or the diglycerides. Um, and of course, as you very well know, position on the glycerol backbone uh, greatly affects the rate and the fate of absorption of um, specific fatty acids. And so, you know, the short chain fatty acids, or the medium chain fatty acids, I should say, are transported primarily in the, um, in the uh, biportal method, and getting them into the lymphatics is, is uh, not as uh, robust. So this is uh, a, a couple of figures from Akita and all. And what they showed was a more efficient lymphatic transport of long chain fatty acids, actually, and medium chain fatty acids when they were incorporated into the SN2 position. So this, uh, this particular uh, experiment is not looking at mi oil mixtures, it's looking at different structures. So they gave um, the, the, the filled symbols show linoleate absorption given either as um, the straight linoleate, which is the, uh, is the circle, or 18-2, uh, 10-18-2, uh, so we have the, uh, the uh, decanoic acid in the SN2 position, uh, that's the square, or 18-2 in the SN2 position and decanoic on the outside, and that's the one that's most readily absorbed. So having, having the, uh, the uh, Long chain fatty acid in the SN2 position is how you get best, uh, most efficient absorption as compared to the other places. Um, and the same actually was true for uh, caproate, um, decanoate. When you put that in the 18-2 in the SN2 position, it was also transported more efficiently. Now this is not a very impressive difference uh, when you look at it on this larger scale, but you have to remember that most of this is still going to um, uh, portal circulation, but you are actually able to make a pretty big um, difference. Now, if this, um, these two graphs are from a slightly different study where they're looking at um, um, structured triglycerides and then they're um, comparing them to uh, oil mixtures of the two. Uh, of the parent mixture. So we have 
this is this is octanoic now octanoic uh, given as eight eighteen to eight, and this is looking at linoleate uh, absorption, linoleate transport, I should say, in the in the lymphatics. When, and uh, as with the previous one, when 18.2 was in the uh, SN2 position, you get a much more robust um, appearance in lymph. When 18.2 was on the outside, or if you just mix the oils, they're all about the same, and it's a reduced rate. Uh, similarly, uh, caprylic, caprylic acid, um, when it's in the central position, the SN2 position, you get a more robust transport of it into the lymph than when it's on the SN1 or in the SN3, one or three positions, or when you have a mixed oil. They're, those uh, things are basically the same. So we, it would appear that by, um, so the conclusion from all this was that by having 8 o or others, others of the uh, medium chains in the SN2 position, you actually preserve that so that it is able to go into the lymph rather than being um, transported in the portal system. Um, not all reports are consistent with these findings, you actually, uh, and, but a lot of it has to do with exactly how they did the experiment. So, um, Mew and Hoy and others have shown that these effects vary depending upon the uh, length, chain length of the medium chain fatty acid. And also, if the total amount of fatty acid available for triglyceride synthesis is low, the, the process uh, is much slower. The triglyceride synthesis is slower. Condomicron assembly and secretion is lower as well, probably because um, there's just not enough substrate. And what happens then is you get use of endogenous fatty acids uh, being diverted for triglyceride production. Now, as has been mentioned before, consequence of greater lymphatic um, medium chain transport is a better delivery of the readily utilized fatty acid energy to peripheral tissues, tissues rather than having it just go predominantly to the liver. Um, there are animal models uh, and clinical studies as well that uh, indicating that interesterified fats actually provide a mechanism, as I alluded to, to deliver medium chain um, to peripheral tissues uh, in patients, especially with high stress, such as burns or certain um, uh, kinds of sur surgical trauma or cancer, uh, and in, in the studies that have been uh, published, this was some time ago, there was uh, much less nitrogen wasting, less organ damage, and a better success for these patients. The, um, the phenomenon of, of, of improving lymphatic transport of medium chains has also been exploited for purposes of clinical nutrition, uh, from malabsorption was alluded to before, and Others here can comment on that much more um, expertly than I can. Um, here's just one figure of data from a paper uh, some time ago by Patrick and one of his long-term uh, collab collaborators, uh, Steve DeMichele uh, from Abbott Labs. And here they looked, again, using the, the rat lymphistula model, which is what uh, is used a great deal in all of these studies. They found increased uh, lymphatic transport of uh, both medium chain fatty acids as well as EPA from interesterified fats uh, as compared to oil mixtures. And here they were using an ischemia reperfusion malabsorption model. The, um, the bottom line here is the uh, uh, injury reperfusion, just given a mixture of the oils. Um, and, excuse me, this is, yeah, these are the control animals. Um, oh, I'm sorry. So this is uh, injured animals receiving the mixed oils. The other solid line is control animals receiving the mixed oils. Over here, we're looking at decanoid uh, uh, transport in the lymph. And then they looked at the uh, uh, structured tri triglycerides, the interesterified fats, and they found that even in the injured, in the injured animals, the, using the interesterified fat increased the transport to essentially the control levels. Um, and, and here's a uh, uh, control animals receiving 
Um, yeah, receiving structure uh, control animals receiving structured triglycerides. So that's that's your highest level. Uh, you can say the same thing with when they looked at EPA, uh, and they've also followed this up with, with other fatty acids. So again, the same thing is true. Um, the, the message here is that using the interesterified fats, you can take an injury animal, injured uh, animal, and restore their um, their fatty acid absorption in the limb to what would normally be controlled uh, levels. So uh, another thing that I've, I've seen a lot of reports in, but I haven't seen any recent work um, well, actually, there was some a little while ago. Several studies in animal models, as well as humans, indicate increased energy expenditure and diminished weight gain, uh, reportedly without changes in food intake when uh, medium chain fatty acid is given as interesterified lipids as compared to mixed triglycerides. Um, in the studies that I saw, I'm not sure that the total nutrient balance was was very carefully modified, uh, mod, mod, uh, modulated, but uh, this is an interesting phenomenon that can be uh, talked about later. Um, so in spite of these differences, overall, uh, fatty acid absorption, if you look at 24 hours, it's not greatly different between triglyceride mixtures or interesterified or structured uh, triglycerides, uh, except for uh, long chain uh, fatty acids 16 and 18, which is, has been mentioned before, that before they form the calcium soaps uh, and are excreted to a greater degree when they're in the 1 3 positions than when they're in the 2. One of the things that I was interested in also, and it was mentioned um, in terms of uh, nutrition, and uh, maybe other people can comment on this because it's certainly something that needs to be thought about. Current data indicate only limited differences in long term tissue fate of the uh, long chain fatty acids from mixed triglyceride or structured fats uh, under, under normal con conditions in normal healthy people. Um, one study looked at incorporation of DHA and EPA into uh, brain phospholipids, and, uh, both in uh, rat dams and in pups, and wasn't able to see an effect of the dietary lipid structure. Um, in one study that I found, uh, EPA, but not DHA, delivery to splenocytes was actually increased, but only if it completely replaced um, all of the 18.3 in the SN2 position of the fed triglycerides. So um, so limited data, limited numbers of studies on that. Uh, just to wrap this up, some areas that I think are still uh, possibly open, and I'd like to hear what other people think about what uh, needs to be done here. I didn't find much information about the effects of structured lipids on chylomicron size or apolipoprotein composition. ApoB is always going to be there, uh, but what's not known is, is uh, whether or not it changes the amount of A4 or A1, um, uh, and especially the chylomicron size. Uh, there's reasons to expect difference is differences in postprandial metabolism based on the size of the chylomicrons and certainly the composition, and we could uh, maybe talk about that a little later. Um, and other than the medium chain usage for energy, I've not seen a lot, uh, a really uh, thorough direct comparison uh, analysis, I should say, of acute postprandial tissue fate of lipids from interesterified versus mixed triglycerides. And um, by that I mean literally in the postprandial period. Uh, long term, they, everything seems to even out. Um, other things in terms of metabolic disease, uh, no reports that I found on how these different lipids, structured lipids especially, might affect uh, secretion of other gut hormones like GIP or GLP-1 which um, play pretty significant roles in insulin sensitivity and metabolic disease. So then, what I'll switch to is um, a little discussion about post, this, this idea of postprandial effects. I know Casey Hayes is going to talk about this a lot more uh, in the afternoon, so 
I'm only going to dwell on a certain aspect of it, and that's on um, the immediate postprandial period um, and how lipid absorption and fatty acids might affect inflammation. Uh, I'm going to start with presenting some, some work which was recently published from Patrick's lab, uh, postdoc there, Young Ji or Joy. Uh, and they looked at intestinal mast cell activation. This isn't so much with structured triglycerides, but there are some data in, in their recent results that suggest that this, uh, this uh, area needs to be perhaps looked at more. So uh, gut immune cells play an important role in host defense. Uh, mast cells affect innate as well as adaptive immune responses. Um, you get release of histamines, prostaglandins, cytokines. And they're also implicated in GI, disorder, GI disorders such as uh, irritable bowel syndrome, irritable bowel disease, and perhaps in food allergies as well. Um, dietary lipids have been shown to affect lymphocyte migration and activation in the actual uh, intestinal lymph. And these also could be relevant to um, inflammatory bowel disorders and food allergies. So what, uh, what Joy and Patrick looked at was what are the effects, the immediate effects of fat absorption including the type of fatty acid that you're giving, giving on um, uh, protease, histamine, and prostaglandin release from mast cells. And I'll just show you a little bit of their data. So here they're looking at um, mast cell protease 2 release, RMPC2. And they find that it's, this again is in the rat lymph fistula model. So here's, um, here's a western blot of lymph from uh, different hours postprandially. And um, you're seeing uh, an increase, uh, well, a marked increase and then a, and a decrease in uh, protease uh, secretion into the lymph, shown graphically uh, on the right. And this, this result was actually dose dependent. So the amount of, they're giving lipocin here, which is soy based um, emulsion. In a follow up study, what they looked what they found was that this activation requires long chain fatty acids and that 18.2 linoleic is much more active than 18.1 or 18.3. This is um, an interesting finding. So uh, down here, the black bar is just the uh, control of uh, bile salt phospholipid emulsion that was used to, uh, not emulsion, excuse me, um, solution that was used to hold the emulsions. The orange bar is trilinoleum, uh, very similar to what's seen with lipocin. And again, this is a protease release. The green is tricaprilin. So when you go down to 18, uh, yeah, to uh, um, the, the medium chains, you see none of this mast cell uh, activation. They looked at this a little further to see whether or not the uh, chain length had, a, had an effect. And what they saw was that um, triolein, they actually barely took it, a, just a slight bump, barely above the, uh, the background. Again, uh, trilinoleum, uh, similar to what's here in the, in the lipocin group before, and trilinolenin, 18.3, was actually, uh, actually had less of an effect than trilinoleate. Uh, histamine release uh, basically par parallels what is seen with the mast cell protease, oleate, uh, linolenate, oleate in the uh, triolate in the blue, linolenate, lin yes, linolenate in the green, and linoleate in the uh, in the red bar. And so the other question I wanted to ask as well is this: uh, just something about the digestion and absorption or is it something specific to the secretion of the chylomicron particles themselves? And the answer is uh, maybe a little bit of both. So they uh, again did the lipocin experiment. So this is a linoleate. And in the second set of rats done at the same time, they pre-treated with chloronic L81, which blocks secretion of the chylomicron particle from the enterocyte. And what they saw was the um, that the uh, the protease release, and this is also true for the histamine, was actually decreased by about 50% if you look at the area under the curve. 
uh, 40 or 50 percent reduction. So, but not a complete, uh, not a complete diminution. Over on the on the right is triglyceride output. So, there is a um, there's a dampening of the uh, mast cell activation, but a complete lack of uh, chylomicron secretion into the lymph. So it's um, it's a little bit of both is the short answer. And they're in the process of trying to follow this up. Um, as would be expected, uh, prostaglandin release uh, kind of follows what the histamine and the protease did. Black bars are uh, PG2, PGD2, prostaglandin D2 secretion into lymph with uh, liposin versus saline. And they actually found, interestingly, that if you give a second dose of liposin after about four hours of this, uh, so about four hours after the first infusion, you actually get a second uh, considerable spike in the amount of prostaglandin that's, that's being released. Physiological consequences of this are, are not clear, um, and that's a matter of, of uh, thought and discussion. But, but clearly there's something going on here. And the idea that the different kind of fatty acid um, has an effect on this process, I think, is, is perhaps worth continuing to investigate. So I also want to touch just briefly on leukocyte activation. So this is now moving from the uh, out of the lymphatics and into the circulation, and its potential relation to peripheral tissue inflammation and metabolic disease. And I know, um, I think Casey Hayes is going to touch on this a lot more later on. So I'll just to show him show a few a few bits of data here. Um, so the postprandial period, as, as everybody knows, when serum lipids are the highest is considered to be a period of high risk for cardiovascular events uh, and reports in recent years, some of which I'll just touch on, suggest that this could be true for other metabolic diseases as well, that the risk might be going up um, due to lipid-induced inflammation. So in addition to the known chronic effects of specific dietary fatty acids, and I'm thinking about uh, 18-0 and, and uh, 18 and 16, palmitate and stearate, there may be acute effects as well. And one of the things that's known, very well known, uh, is that palmitate and stearate activate a variety of signaling pathways and cascades um, in several different cell types, uh, macrophages, um, as, as well as in uh, several cultured, phages, uh, cultured cell types. Um, NF-kappa-B pathways, the junk pathways, are activated by the saturated fatty acids. So dietary uh, structure as well as composition may be important if it affects where these fatty acids go in that immediate postprandial period. Uh, I have seen very few studies so far on structured triglyceride or interesterified fats with respect to this phenomenon. And, and maybe other people um, know the literature better than I do and, and can, um, can fill me in because I'd be very interested to know. So I'm going to present a little bit of data um, that isn't, you know, it's not looking at structured fats, but it's describing what goes on in the immediate postprandial period and why maybe we should be thinking about it. So this is a postprandial monocyte activation in humans. This is a paper published by Scott Simon's group last year. It was an interesting study. So they took normal epidemic subjects, and they gave them a breakfast challenge, I would call it a challenge at least, of two sausage egg McMuffins with eggs, hash browns, and juice. And that sounded like a really uh, extreme breakfast to me, but I was talking to some lab folks this week and said, oh yeah, those are great. Mm -hmm. really like that. Um, they drew blood before the meal, and then at three and a half and seven hours after the meal. Um, they measured cytokine as well as the usual lipid parameters. They also measured uh, cytokine levels at these different times, and they then um, just lysed the red cells and stained the uh, leukocytes for different um, cell surface markers of uh, for different types of cells, as well as activation versus non-activation. And what they found is kind of summarized uh, pretty well in this in this one figure. Um, and that is at three and a half hours, the gray bars versus seven hours, the black bars. 
So in three and a half hours, there was about a 30% increase in the receptor expression of CD11C, which is on um, on monocytes as well as uh, as neutrophils, and is a mark for activated cells. Uh, CD14 followed the same. CD11B, another marker for the same um, the same phenomenon. Uh, markedly elevated, 25, 30% increase at three and a half hours. But then by seven hours, it goes back down to a baseline. So again, the reason why I'm thinking about this immediate postprandial period. Uh, TNF-alpha, uh, uh, interferon gamma, and some of the interleukins were also elevated at the three and a half hour period. Now what he's also able to do is uh, look at rolling an arrest of the, uh, the monocytes uh, binding to VCAM. Uh, so he, he coats a, uh, um, a little flow cell with uh, VCAM and then he uh, flows his, um, his preparations across the uh, slide and he's able to count the cells which stick. Uh, and the result is, is summarized in the figure on the right. Uh, at zero hours, you get a certain amount of, of uh, monocyte adhesion. At three and a half hours, this is uh, dramatically increased. It's approximately doubled. At seven hours, it's back nearly to baseline. But at this three and a half hour period, um, the white so the white bar is just using uh, a garden variety immunoglobulin as a control antibody. And this is where he sees it. But if he treats with a, a blocking antibody against CD11C, um, he, he's able to prevent most of this binding to the VCAM, and, and that's what would be expected um, since CD11C is involved in, in binding to VCAM. Uh, over on the on the left, he looked at they looked at the correlation of the number of cells which uh, which arrested on the plate to the uh, postprandial um, triglyceride levels and found a, a reasonable correlation there. Now, data that I'm not going to take the time to show because it just doesn't present well. What he found also is that these monocytes contain lipid droplets, postprandial. So again, at the three and a half hour period, there's a lot of lipid in the monocytes. And uh, he did a variety of assays and actually was uh, able to conclude that this is due to chylomicron remnant uptake. Maybe also due to uh, just uptake of the free fatty acids that are released by LPL, but it seems to be that there's actually some whole particle uptake. And it, uh, he was able to, to suggest this also because it was due to the LRP1 receptor. There is one study where um, uh, a group took whole blood from human subjects. So this is an in vitro study, which is, has some similar um, uh, results. Uh, so they're taking whole blood from subjects, just fasting subjects, um, probably a bunch of lab folk, and they um, just incubated the blood with a variety of lipid uh, emulsions, uh, lipofundin, structolipid, omegavin, uh, intralipid, at different doses for two hours. Then they lysed the red cells, do the same kind of thing where they stained for the different uh, uh, side, uh, different uh, inflammatory markers and then analyzes the uh, preparations by flow cytometry. Again, it's not a postprandial study, but it may have some uh, some relevance to this issue, and it may actually be a model for uh, parenteral nutrition. What they found is shown here, and that is that there's a dose-dependent increase in CD11B on neutrophils as well as on monocytes uh, in the this is the LM group. The colors are not showing up at all. So, um, so the LM is is lipofundin, which is a mixture of medium chain and long chain. Fish oil is one of these two lines here, and the other L is intralipid. So that's uh, primarily linoleic. It's not a mixture. These are so these are both different long chain um, mixtures. They're not showing any activation at all. Uh, and then I thought I would just share in a few minutes here uh, another case of, of monocyte activation in, uh, and, and uh, in follow-up inflammation. And in this case, I'm just going to describe some data from um, NPC1L1 knockout mice that we've uh, been studying recently. 
And so the data, I think, are well, maybe at least related to changes in saturated fat absorption. So um, in addition to, well, so NPC1L1, excuse me, is the intestinal, lipo, uh, intestinal protein that blocks, um, excuse me, that's involved in cholesterol uh, uptake. And it's blocked by the drug azetamide. But we demonstrated uh, in a previous study that with Zeti-treated mice or NPC1L1 knockouts, these mice are actually protected from diet-induced obesity and diabetes, insulin resistance, in addition to having um, decreased cholesterol absorption. And so the straight line here is uh, just control mice being fed a uh, uh, high-calorie diet, whereas the other lines are either child-fed mice or um, Zeti-treated or knockout mice being fed the same high-fat diet. Um, very confusing figure on the right, but the bottom line is the only the only line that's different from any of the others is the top line, and that's the one that shows in a decreased insulin sensitivity or a, a, a more profound excursion from baseline in the mice that are on this line as opposed to any of the others. So blocking L1 function may have important metabolic effects beyond just blocking cholesterol absorption and reducing LDL levels. Um, now, initially, a lot, of, a lot of people thought this was just a mouse phenomenon, but there's been a, a few reports in the last year or so um, that suggest that this also may be occurring in humans. Um, in one study, they followed HOMA IR. In another one, they had followed waist-to-hip ratio as well as, as uh, HOMA IR and other things. And they found that in zetia treated people, there was um, an improvement in these indices that they were able to show statistically at least was independent of the lowering of LDL by the drug. As part of our initial study, which we should have put this piece in there first, um, we actually looked at fat absorption in the zetia treated or the knockout mice, and we saw some reduction in overall fatty acid absorption not a huge difference. But what we really saw a difference um, is in meristate palmitate and steroids. So these are the uh, long chain saturates. Uh, steroid especially is in control animals, it's around 70%, at least in this, the way we did the study. It goes down to uh, about 50% in the knockouts of the zetia treated mice. Uh, there's also a reduction in palmitate from around 90 to about 80%. And a minor change in meristate as well. So it's chain like dependent, but uh, you know, I was especially interested in the palmitate and the steroid effects. So, um, oh, sorry, don't need to talk about that slide. It's just um, a sales pitch for the way we do the the uh, fat balance using uh, an olestra based compound. So we've investigated the ramifications of this lower saturated fat absorption in the mice, uh, looking for um, whether or not there's a contribution to metabolic uh, disease other than decreased weight gain. So we postulated that the lack of L1 function resulting in reduced saturated fat absorption may reduce uh, inflammation uh, both in visceral adipose tissue as well as immediately uh, postprandial. And so we followed the same methods. Here what we did is took, uh, so these are just animals on a chow diet. We fast them do a blood draw in, in fasting conditions, and then three hours after a gavage of either lard or olive oil. Um, so it's an emulsion. We're giving equal amounts of fat here. Uh, so again, not anything structured, but um, something that might be of interest. And what we found is, is summarized here. If you look at um, just the wild type mice, Gavage with lard, we see monocyte in, in activation, which is in, increased about uh, uh, 40 or 50 percent. In the knockout mice, this is essentially um, uh, brought down to baseline, so there's no difference between fasting and postprandial. Zetia treated, um, also no difference. So it appears that just blocking that that amount of, or one one interpretation at least, is that blocking that amount of stearate and palmitate absorption is able to reduce this postprandial inflammation. Um, we didn't see any drug or gene effect following olive oil gavage.
So those animals had the same levels of activation all across the board. Uh, we looked at um, cytokine expression. And in the knockout mice, um, cytokine expression is, is decreased. Uh, this is actually in the, uh, in the fat pads. And when we look at macrophage, actually in the, in the adipose, we're looking both at the M1 and the M2 type. So the M1 type macrophage is the one that's pro-inflammatory. M2s are um, considered to be alternatively activated. So the M1 is activated for inflammation, the M2 is activated more for tissue repair and remodeling. And what we see is that uh, in the animals that have received, uh, in this case it's Western diet fed mice, the, um, the amount of M1 phages, M1 macrophages are lower in the knockouts and the amount of M2 macrophages are higher in the knockouts. This is at a time before there's any difference in, um, in weight or insulin sensitivity. So this is not a direct um, measure of a postprandial effect, but one can possibly infer that this is a result of changing postprandial inflammation. By diminishing that, you um, have less monocytes extravasating into the tissues. So decreasing the acute effect in the plasma compartment may protect against chronic inflammation and um, and that brings me to the, uh, the final slide here. And that is that there's not much of, um, information out there right now on the effect of structured or intersterified effects, intersterified lipids on this postprandial, uh, these postprandial processes. Does the composition of the lipid or the structure of the lipid have an effect on remnant particles and the degree of monocyte activation that they might induce uh, when the amount of activation they might induce in, in monocytes and neutrophils, which appear to take them up. Um, and then how these different lipids affect um, gut immune functions is also uh, an open question. Um, but I think that given the importance of inflammation to insulin resistance and metabolic disease, these may be areas uh, for future studies. So thank you.